General Sir Nick Parker uh, retired from the UK Army as Supreme Commander of UK Ground Forces. Forty years earlier, he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Green Jackets. And you can imagine that over the course of time, of those 40 years, he served in many places around the world in many functions. In particular, outside the UK, he served in Bosnia and in Sierra Leone, and then back in the UK uh, a number of times in Northern Ireland, and uh, supervised the uh, departure of the British troops the last time he was there from that province. He also served in Iraq and Afghanistan, both as the commander of and the deputy commander of ISAC, the International Security Assistance Force. That's officially what we called it. He was deputy to two well-known generals of ours, McChrystal and Petraeus, and I think he'll tell us a little bit about what that meant to serve under those guys <laughs> at that time. And interestingly, all three generals are members of the boards of somewhere along the international uh, network of Team Rubicon. His military, his military service is distinguished and well-known, but he's also a father who knows the tragedy of war. Just before he assumed command in ISAC, his son Harry, a captain in the Green Jackets, uh, sorry, in the Royal Rifles, uh, was severely wounded in Afghanistan. And Harry survived that with, the, I think, the pluck and courage of his father. But he's now, among other things, a critically acclaimed author. He's on his second book, the first of which is called The Anatomy of a Soldier. It's a novel, but if you want to see what the uh, war is like in the last 15 years for the men and women where all the coalition countries are putting into that theater, this is an absolute must. It's been translated into six languages, it's now in paperback, and when I bought this on Amazon, it was trending very well. After retiring from the military, uh, Sir Nick uh, got involved with forming a mutual insurance company uh, similar to the company we know in this country, USAA, for service members. I think a number of us are members of USAA. He's also a passionate supporter of Veterans Affairs. He's very much involved with Prince Harry and the various things that Harry's doing, like the Invictus Games, and, and as I said, on Team Rubicon. I know him as a board member who was looked to for his wisdom and his point of view by his fellow board members and as a friend. It's a great pleasure to introduce General Sir Nick Parker. I'll be able to keep you amused for about five minutes just by my accent. Um, and then you know, if, you, if I see you start getting bored, I'll tell my only American joke, <laughs> with an English accent. Um, it, thank you, Charles, very much for the introduction. It's a, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I have to say, I've been to some quite strange places in the world. I've, I've, I've stood there and I've thought, and I'll point a couple of them out, I thought how remarkably lucky I was to be there for all sorts of different reasons. And when Charles took me around your amazing estate, it's more than an estate, uh, today I felt very lucky to be here and I'm sure all of you uh, have an amazing time but it's a, an extraordinary place uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. What I thought I would do is to just give you a, a sort of very superficial potted history of my <laughs> service drawing on a couple of themes. Um, the first theme is what it's like to work with Americans. <laughs> well, you might find that amusing. Um, on the basis that some people say there's a special relationship, and I'll leave you to make that decision at the uh, make that judgment at the end. Uh, and secondly, I want to talk a bit about the transition of service men and women <coughs> from service back into normal life, into civilian life, because I think there are probably some parallels with the experience in this country, with the experiences that I've had. And I know Charles has spoken to you in the past about uh, the charity that we are both setting up called Team Rubicon, and it'll just give you a slightly different perspective about that. I am passionate about uh, the potential that service men and women have, and I'll just, just highlight why and, and a few of the, the thoughts. Now, 
I have been extremely fortunate um, in the 40 years of service, um, but, it, but my career was rather odd. I, I suppose for the first two-thirds of my career, I was a very conventional British soldier. I went to Northern Ireland and did what we had to do in Northern Ireland, and I uh, played my part in the Cold War in Germany, and I did my staff jobs in London, and everything that you would expect in a fairly run-of-the-mill career. And then in 1995, 96, things started for me to change, and the last third of my career was extraordinary, um, because the world has become really quite fragile and extraordinary. Um, I, I started in Bosnia in 1996, 1997, you remember there was uh, a, lot of, a lot of very tragic uh, mistreatment in a very complicated conflict between Croatians, Serbs, uh, and Bosnian Muslims. Uh, I went there after they had fought themselves to a standstill. So the peace in Bosnia was generated largely because they had no more fight left in them. Uh, and with some bickering between <coughs> the European states and the US, eventually NATO moved in and established a, 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 a force there which effectively kept a peace that had already been made. Not a bullet was fired at me in that. It wasn't what I would call a hot conflict. But we saw then two key things. The first, what awful things humans from civilized societies seem to be able to do to each other. And secondly, that to resolve contemporary conflict, you have to do it in an international coalition. And it was in this case, it once again, I mean, it's a theme, but it was the power of the US military machine that really provided the, that underwrote everything that the rest of us did. But it was essential for the credibility of the coalition, of the I-4, I that there were as many other nations involved and properly involved as possible to give it global credibility. <clears throat> it, may, it may be uncomfortable for this audience, but if things are seen to be done by America, they are not necessarily treated in the same way as if they're done by a benevolent international community, which includes America. And so, it was, it was very interesting for me to begin to learn how to operate with an ally that I have come to trust and respect and depend on since 1997. I had a little bit of a detour in 2002 because there was a little bit of colonial difficulty. I don't, don't, don't ever repeat that I said that. I didn't say that on the um, Sierra Leone had a very nasty, hot conflict with a group of people who were uh, aggravated by President Charles Taylor in Liberia. And it was all over diamonds that were in the top, the, the, the high country of Sierra Leone that were being robbed and taken out through Liberia, sold for huge amounts of money, which constitu had constituted the, one of the main uh, elements of the Sierra Leonean economy, which created internal tensions that had resulted in effectively an insurgency uh, and a war, an internal war. And uh, the insurgents, who were chaotic but brutal, uh, got very close to the capital, Freetown, and the British sent a force to extract their nationals. So it was sent to get people out of the embassy, put them on an aircraft carrier and take them home. But that force was misunderstood by the enemy. And they thought we'd come to give them a bloody nose. And the assault on the capital stopped. And because of that, Tony Blair, who was the Prime Minister at the time, approved further military intervention, almost accidentally, in order to stabilise the country. And I went there on the sort of second churn, so the, I was there six months after all of that had happened, 
to try to stabilize the country, to advise the Sierra Leone armed forces, uh, to advise the president, and to bring the uh, rebels, the, the, royal, the, the uh, revolutionary united front to their knees. Uh, there was the largest UN force ever deployed, UNAMSIL, which had 13,000 troops in it, which was useless because it had a mandate, not because of the soldiers who were in the force, but because the political mandate that the force had didn't allow them to engage in combat. The Brits had 400 people there, but they were acting as advisors inside the Sierra Leone armed forces and were therefore able to effectively, through proxy, make the Sierra Leone army fight in a way that it needed to in order to defeat the rebels. Very convenient for a Western politician not to put their people at risk. And we need to ponder it a bit. We were told we weren't allowed in military terms to send any of our advisors further forward than what we call the brigade headquarters because that is seen in linear, old-fashioned terms as being behind the front, which of course it isn't in modern warfare. Uh, but the, the, the reason the politicians gave us that direction was because they didn't want any of our people to be killed. The reality was that we had to go right up into the front for credibility and in order to ensure that our advice was accepted. And I think the, the Sierra Leoneans, with our help, did a fantastic job. But the, I learned then that the UN had some amazing West African negotiators, people who understood the culture of the country. And the Secretary General Special Re Representative, who was a difficult gentleman called Adeniji, Nigerian, he negotiated the truce with the rebels because he understood them and was a brilliant negotiator, something which we couldn't do. So I saw in Sierra Leone how you can work together, even when you think that you, and we didn't really respect the UN, would never have said that at the time, but they had attributes which were fundamental to the success of the campaign. So the second sort of lesson that I got out of that was that you, you can't do these things in foreign countries without a real understanding of the culture and a real understanding of how you manage you could say manipulate that culture to the advantage of peace. Uh, in 2005, so well after the attack in Iraq, I went to Baghdad, and that was another, and this is really going to offend you, but I remember standing by a palace on uh, one of Saddam Hussein's palaces, uh, looking out over the rows and rows of American tanks that were parked. It was a huge, huge base and thinking, I cannot imagine, I could never have imagined standing here outside Saddam's palace uh, if I'd been r reflecting from my desk in the Ministry of Defence even six years earlier. And I say, I probably never imagined I'd be in South Carolina. <laughs> um, but uh, Iraq, uh, you know as much as you need to or want to know about Iraq. It was... A, a bloody, bloody conflict, and it was, uh, I worked for a general, who I'll put his picture up in a minute, um, American general, as part of the multinational corps, and it was then that I learned that your armed forces have an extraordinary amount of grit and determination. The beginning of the Iraq conflict, the Brits rather smugly said, we know about this sort of thing because we've done it in Northern Ireland. Nothing could have been further from the truth for two reasons. The first was the enemy was a very different sort of enemy. The suicide bomber and the roadside bomb are new, were then new challenges that we had to learn to face. And secondly, we, we just didn't get the culture and our politicians would not let us do the sorts of things that we had to do, get right in amongst the Iraqis in order to help them develop their capability. Uh, and it meant that we, the Brits, never really got fully involved because of political sensitivity about casualties. Sadly, it doesn't stop the casualties. On the other side, the American forces got really involved. I was 
incredibly impressed by the bravery and the commitment of people to get right involved in the fight. Um, sometimes a little clumsily. Um, you learn in any conflict. But if you have people who are committed, as committed as that force was, and you're a coalition partner, you have to be impressed by the way that they behave. So that was an experience, an important experience for me, because it was the time in my military career where I became indebted to our largest coalition partner. I then had another detour um, to Northern Ireland, and as Charles said, I, I had the good fortune, it was actually rather tiresome, but I had the good fortune to be the last commander, military commander, in Northern Ireland at the end of the Troubles, 38 years of Troubles in Northern Ireland, a um, lot of casualties, a lot of deaths over 38 years, a sustained insurgency was brought to an end in 2006. And I, I was, that was very interesting, part of history, I was, I was fortunate to be there. The reason it was tiresome was because the politics, rightly, drove us to stop behaving in a forceful military way, drove us to start to behave as if we were part of the community or as if we were irrelevant, no longer relevant to security. That was the police's job. And that was absolutely right. And I, over that year, pressed for the military to start doing that, to start behaving normally, which is really difficult. If you've had, a, effectively, a war for 38 years, your culture, your military culture, is one of uh, behaving in a very, not aggressive, but a very protective sort of way. You, you're not used to going into the community and behaving normally. You're always looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's placing a bomb under your car. And what we were saying was, no, this is all finished, peace is here, behave normally, you are now just part of the, not the community like a garrison. Uh, very sadly, uh, just about two months before I left, um, two of our soldiers were killed in an ambush outside one of our camps by some renegade IRA uh, terrorists, which of course drove a coach and horses through the line that I'd been taking to the military community to behave normally. Um, and in, in my view, the military community has never recovered from that in Northern Ireland. The peace is held, but the military are not integrated into the community. And it's not a very nice place to be based if you're there in a domestic base. That's where your, your military base is. You still live looking over your shoulder a bit. And it's a pity because I think with, if we had been a little bit harder, a little bit longer, we might have stop that happening, stop the attack happening, and we would have a very different env environment there where the community, the community accepted us more, ironically. Um, I then went from Ireland to Afghanistan. Yeah, I've been sort of leaping around the world a bit. I wouldn't have expected to go there either. Um, I, I, I was in Afghanistan from 2009-2010 um, uh, as the deputy coalition commander. So. So, as, as Charles has said, I was number two to two extremely distinguished U.S. generals. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in that context in a minute. I won't bang on about Afghanistan now. And then finally, and probably the most amusing thing that I did in my career, I became what in, only, the, only the British could do this. I became a thing called the Commander-in-Chief. It was a wonderful title. I'm not quite sure what I was Commander-in-Chief of. I think I was, I was probably, in civilian terms, I was probably the British Army's either Chief Executive or Chief Operating Officer. I had one soldier above me who was in, he had to deal with the politicians. Um, and I was the sort of the next layer down. But it was, a, it was a great job because one was effectively in charge of what people did rather than the policy. And it was at the time of the London Olympics, and the contract to provide venue security for the London Olympics was awful. And we, and, and the, our political masters, did not want any military involvement. I think they were still reflecting on Beijing, which had a great deal of military presence. That's the way they do these things. And the, for some reason, the British thought that if the British military were involved, we might militarise the games, forgetting that we're an army for a democracy who's actually comes from the people and quite liked by the people. But that's by the by. 
Um, when, when this contract went wrong, um, we, in about, we, had to, we had to make some contingency plans because it was clear that things weren't going as well as the politicians and the government would say. So we, we stood by some people. And I think the contractor waved the flag of surrender on the 11th of July with the game starting on the 27th of July. Yeah. And we deployed, I think in the end, 22,000 troops, which is quite a lot for the Brits. Um, and it was, no thanks to me, it was just it showed that the modern soldier in Britain is very adaptable and was truly loved by the people because they absolutely adored going through the security. They were, they were just very welcoming and it was the most amazing, amazing experience for us because it put us onto the streets of our own country which is not something we do an awful lot. And with Northern Ireland, we'd always been encouraged not to wear uniform because we would be seen to be a target to a member of the Irish army who might be working undercover in, in, on the UK mainland. And I will come back to that in the culture of transition in a minute. Um, I had one more amazing experience this afternoon. <laughs> Charles, Charles is rather rude. I, I fish for trout. He calls them itty bitty trout. I think that must be an American. Um, and and salmon. And uh, I, I, I think that, I think that's a flounder. It was tiny. And, and we haven't eaten it. Um, just just to go back to the relationships with with our American masters, my American masters, on two big both in Iraq and Afghanistan. After my uh, tour of Iraq, I went to Fort Bragg in North Carolina to, to talk about coalition operations. And I was trying to explain to the audience, who were all military, what it felt like for me coming into a very dominant American environment um, to operate. And the way I had these two guys... George Casey, who's a, a remarkable general, uh, he was the, the supreme boss, and a guy called J.R. Vines, uh, who was a parachutist, who was, he just terrified me. I mean, he, he, he looks quite frightening, and he was. And I remember going into his office and saying to him, in the way that I suppose we do, I said, I think we've got a bit of a problem. There was a refinery on fire <laughs> up the road and, I, and he said if it's a bit of a problem don't bother me <laughs> so, so I, when I said it was a refinery on fire he nearly punched me uh, but these guys these guys fitted into a sort of a, a box uh, they, they, that's what the Brits <laughs> At that stage, that's what the Brits thought that American soldiers were like. <laughs> Wrongly. But then, of course, the American soldiers all thought I was like that. <laughs> sort of foppish and... And when I was talking to this audience, I think they, they were probably airborne. A voice at the back of the audience just shouted this name. <laughs> and the, the Austin, Austin Powers, who is not British, it's all a complete fake. Um, but it, it, what that does do is it illustrates the position that we all, in an extreme way, I accept, the position that we all start looking at each other's cultures. And even now, and I, I work with Charles on a global board which has Dave Petraeus on it. Even now, we sometimes talk past each other because our interpretation of the same language is different. And in some ways, in some ways, not in all ways, it's easier to operate uh, with someone like the French or the Germans where you are formally interpreting what you're saying. And you have to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand when the interpreter talks complete gobbledygook to you rather than having a conversation between a Brit and a Canadian and an American and an Australian, 
where you all assume you're all understanding what's going on, but there's no discipline of actually asking the question. Um, just let me now just sort of revert to one of my more intriguing experiences. Um, I started in Afghanistan working for General Stanley McChrystal. He was a, an extraordinarily brilliant uh, American general. I go, just before I go any further, does anyone know Stan? Anyone know Dave Petraeus? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> um, th this guy was, uh, a tr he was a train killer. He was special forces. He ate one meal a day. That's not true. He used to snack on pretzels from morning till night and have a massive dinner, but it was good for the I mean, to say he ate once a day. He'd sleep about half a minute a night and he was running all the time. I mean, I'm a typical sort of fat Brit. I <laughs> sleep eight hours a day and eat a huge amount. Um, so complete antithesis of this guy. Um, he came to Afghanistan and he very, very quickly understood that the way that we were behaving was alienating the population. We were, we were striking targets that had bad people in them, but the strikes were killing innocent members of the local population. And we were turning the ordinary population into terrorists by our behavior. And he very quickly understood that the people were the heart of this. We had to protect the people. And if we did things that did that, we would be more likely to be able to bring back control for them in their country. So you have this guy who is absolutely trained, to, I mean a brilliant special forces operator, but who had the perception and the depth to interpret a plan that was very innovative. I mean, made some of his subordinates extremely uncomfortable when they were told that if there was any doubt about what they were about to fire on, even if there was risk to themselves, they needed to think about that and what we termed apply courageous restraint. So you restrain yourselves in order not to hurt the innocent people, even if your life is at risk. It's extremely difficult to do. But this guy was uh, amazing. And I count him now as uh, a friend. He's set up a business, an advisory business, which I think is doing extremely well. Um, He's, he's developed concepts of his networking, which he used in Special Forces, in a way that is extremely innovative in the business world. And I was just getting used to working for him when an article appeared in a magazine called Rolling Stone, not one that I read very often. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's over in the house over there. But, um, kind of, it drops through everybody's doors every day here, I'm sure. But it was... Um, it, it essentially... It, it reported an incident that had happened in Paris where he had been, was reported to have been insubordinate in his comments about the president. Not strictly true, but it was, the damage was done. He was called back to Washington. And I, unexpectedly, I was sitting in Kabul and suddenly we see on the television these pictures coming up with the president saying that uh, Stan McChrystal's been relieved and Dave Petraeus is coming out. Now Dave was, Dave was sort of almost a king by then, he was so senior. Uh, and he was being sent down, effectively sent down a lair in order to take over from um, Stan McChrystal. And I, as the deputy, was the bloke who was supposed to now be in charge. So for, for I suppose for about 10 days while Congress did its thing, I, I found myself as the uh, commander in Afghanistan of this NATO force. Now. The fact is that if an operation is working well, the deputy has to do absolutely nothing. It just carries on regardless. But I remember being rung up by the British Prime Minister, then David Cameron. Uh, to, first of all, he congratulated me. I have no idea what he was congratulating me for, because it was the misfortune of my superior that was, <laughs> which seemed a very strange thing to say. And then he asked me if I was all right. And I, that shows a misunderstanding of how the military operate. You have this very clear hierarchy. And all I had to do was to stay there and keep a hand on a tiller that was very clearly pointing in the right direction for 10 days, which wasn't exactly. I mean, I can't really put much in my memoirs about it. <laughs> um, and then this guy appears who 
who has a huge amount of experience in, uh, in Iraq, who is, is respected by globally and certainly in America. And it was a very interesting change of behavior. Uh, the first thing that took me a little bit by surprise is he mistakenly started referring to Kabul as Baghdad, which is the sort of thing which can happen when, when people move quickly into new places. But that was not a good thing to say to the Afghans. Um, but he, he, again, showed a level of understanding about mass military operations, which, for a Brit coming from a small country with a small army, was extremely educational. Uh, and he with, was very sober and thoughtful about the way that he allowed the operation to continue without undermining any of the good ideas that Stan had had, but at the same time just giving it some very gentle changes in direction, which made a huge difference to its eventual outcome. Now, the, the outcome was in 2014. <coughs> Uh, I'm delighted if there's any time. I'll probably go on talking for as long as I can so I don't have to answer any questions. Um, <laughs> but I'd be delighted to answer any questions if you wished on what it's like now. Not that I've been back there, but it was a successful military operation thanks to the quality of these commanders. Uh, probably it has not been such a successful political, uh, economic, and social operation. But we shall see. What I'd like to do for the last five, ten minutes of my talk is talk a little bit about the, the transition process. Um, if, and if you're, if, if, if it's, you're bored. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you imagine that this arrow is the, the movement of a soldier, or sailor, airman or airwoman or out of the, out of the military, they, they are in a range of really high quality people who are extremely high, you know, aircraft pilots, nuclear engineers. The, the, the vast majority have general skills, good general skills. Some of them are hugely motivated and can take a knock or two, and some of them are less motivated. And then at the bottom, as in any large organisation, you're going to get some people who leave who face challenges. I mean, there is a there is a recurring conversation about PTSD, and, and there, that, that, there is an element of that, and these people sit in this bottom part. What we have to do is to try to encourage the best possible transfer. And what happens at the moment in Britain is there's a bunch of people who succeed. They, they, they're just good enough. They will always succeed. Don't need to do anything about them. They'll be, they'll be okay. You get a big bunch who do okay, but in my view, probably we don't realize their full potential, and so we should be trying to do more for them. And then there is a group that are vulnerable and who really need help. And you'll notice it's very subtle, but there's a little overlap here. So it's not just the people who face challenges. If I develop that a touch, this, if you don't, if you don't concentrate on it, there's a group of people who, who, in the general skills, can become a success. And there's a group of people, and, and this, that's here. Then there's a group of people who, if you don't keep an eye on them, will get drawn down into the disaster area. In Britain, these people are what our military charities worry about, I'm afraid. This, is, this has become the, the narrative. It's, it, I mean, the, the, there are loads and loads of charities which are looking after the people who are not doing okay. Now, this is necessary, but it's also a problem. Because what it does is it produces a narrative of sympathy. There is a tendency for people in Britain to think that an ex-serviceman or woman has got a problem. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I hope you get what I mean. <laughs> Uh, you don't see here any charities that are saying, these guys are fantastic. You, you get Barclays and City and Goldman Sachs hiring more of the people in that top bit. Um, but you, you, you don't get people who can understand. I, you all know this thing from the films. I mean, the, 
There, there is a, all of us, when we leave, are going through this journey. All of us are, need some sort of stimulation. Some of, some of this will be self-motivated, but some stimulation that brings you through to, to feel bigger and better. And in the previous slide, here, these people conduct their own hero's journey. These people do not and need help. But the vast majority here, in my view, need something that will really promote their potential. And that, that's why, unashamedly, I think this is Team Rubicon. Team Rubicon is a, a charity started in the US, which Charles has talked to you about, but which, by setting itself up as an, uh, an objective to help others in disasters, particularly overseas, you, you then have a double benefit. You help the communities you go to, and you help the people by giving them a sense of team and a sense of purpose who are going to do it. You, you give them the fuel for the hero's journey so that if they, in their voluntary time, have become a part of this organisation, they will do better in all other parts of their lives. Um, I'm going to whip through this because it's you're far too intelligent an audience. <laughs> but there are going to be more disasters. Just because the world, everybody thinks we're getting on top of the world, technology is getting better, there are going to be more disasters. I have to put that slide up when I'm talking to Oxfam and those sorts of people because they're quite suspicious about a soldier talking about disaster relief, which you can probably understand. Why, why is it that we are important in this? But why, why do we play an important role? For the following reasons. <laughs> We've just been taught to do chaos. So you don't lose that when you leave the military. We, we know about doing things quickly, because that's what we've done when we're in the military. We're not phased when somebody says, you're going to Afghanistan tomorrow, because you sort of, it's part of the excitement of the, of the life that we lead. Um, if you go somewhere, you take your kit in your pack. You don't need a five-star hotel. And you're actually quite proud of living off the stuff that you have in your back. <laughs> we do work with local communities. We have done things like help the communities in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and we also know about collaborating with others instinctively. We can make an, an immediate difference because we focus on the mission. And uh, the, the charity itself as any charity, has to be transparent and cost-effective. I mean, Britain charity law is now so tough that you can't get away without doing that. So if you combine all of those things, and there might just be one more, yeah. If, if, if I'm asking for a volunteer for an employer in Britain, the employer gets really nervous that they're going to go away for months mm -hmm. and they won't be doing their job. We, we, we can do this. I mean, disasters do not go on for very long, and we can limit the deployment to two weeks and then turn people over. So we can reassure an employer that we're not going to have a huge impact. And why do we make an impact? Because if there is a disaster, you have, uh, in the very early, this is the disaster happens here. In the very early stages, there are a high degree of people who are injured. So there's a maximum ability to affect, but that tails off very quickly. Um, if, if you're trying to assess what's gone on, it's appalling at the very beginning but after time, the assessment gets better, so you then know what's happened. And therefore, intervention has an impact that increases rapidly in about the first 72 hours, a little bit more probably, and then tails off to a sort of steady state. Now, what we maintain with this bunch of ex-service men and women is that we can really affect this area by getting there quickly, by living out of our packs, by reacting to unexpected tasks at the moment when any disaster really needs it. And the great thing about this organization is it's, it's taken uh, advantage of the coalitions of the last 15 years. So there are lots of countries in the world that have veterans, and not just English speaking, but lots of countries that have veterans who've operated in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, who naturally work together well. And therefore, and I go back to my one of the rude points I made early on, it's not an American charity, it's an international charity with huge American help and the largest organization, the largest, largest part of Team Room and it is the American branch. But its brand is international and therefore particularly in the, in the uh, humanitarian community, 
uh, and in some of the third world countries, it does not have the same stigma that a single national intervention would have. Um, Charles slightly stole my thunder because I, I am massively proud of one person. Um, and I just, at the, end of, at the end of every talk, I just do buy his book. <laughs> uh, he, 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 the, the, this, this is my son. Um, he, he, wrote, he wrote a book uh, in uh, 2013. I think he first, the first book he wrote was about a, it was a, a narrative from a sniffer dog. And he went, uh, in, in Afghanistan, and he went to a creative writing course and they told him it was rubbish. So, so he bunged it in the bin. And then they had to do an exercise, which was to write a short story, uh, in no more than two sides or something, which had an impact on the people that you were writing, uh, you were presenting it to. And so he wrote a story about a tourniquet in an incident based on his own experience, but a tourniquet. It was written from the perspective of a tourniquet that was wrapped around a guy's leg who'd been blown up. And of course his audience were completely transfixed. And this led him then to write this book, which is fiction, he insists it's fiction, it is very directly based on his own experience. And it's written, each chapter is written from the perspective of an inanimate object, so 45 inanimate objects. And uh, it has been published in the States, I have no idea how well it's done here. Um, it's been published in Spanish, French, Italian, <coughs> Dutch, German, and just Ukrainian. I don't know why it's been <laughs> But um, I just, I have to do that because I'm dead proud of it. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions. <laughs>